Next speaker is uh, David uh, Hanskrein from uh, Qualcomm. David is the VP of technology there. He has been involved in uh, designing Qualcomm processors for the uh, uh, for smartphones and applications like this, multicores. And he is going to talk about uh, design pitfalls for designing uh, mobile processors. Yep. All right. <laughs> yeah, it works. All right. All right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is David Hansquin. I'm here from Qualcomm uh, out in um, uh, where I'm at the uh, Raleigh, uh, North Carolina location where we do all of our processor development. So I'm here today to uh, give you maybe a different uh, different perspective on things. You know, I know on the you know on the the uh, lectern here it says it's a uh, software week. Uh, I'm actually a hardware guy, so I'll uh, you know I'll, I'll come at this from a, a different perspective. So uh, I'd like to talk to you guys today. Uh, you know, I'll first look uh, first talk about why uh, I think uh, mob mobile's interesting. Uh, some of the compute trends that I've observed for both uh, mobile and uh, and uh, the PC markets, and then uh, and then start really getting into the uh, the, the 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 main part of the um, the talk today, which is looking at some of the pitfalls in. Uh, in, uh, in, in basically uh, tr kind of treating these markets the same, treating the, uh, the processors for, for these markets the same, and, uh, and, and what we uh, might want to do about it. So, uh, you know, the, not, I don't think I'm telling you guys anything here that's new or different than uh, what you've probably observed already. I actually, I, I update the slide about twice a year just because the, the numbers actually accelerate rapidly. You know, it's not like I'm changing, you know, just the, the, the decimal point here. It's, uh, you know, the, fir the first digit changes each time that I go and I update this. So it's very impressive. You know, we have, uh, you know, around the world today, we have as many cellular connections as there are people on the planet, and um, and, and you can see, you know, the, where the number is growing to by uh, 2018. So it, it is very impressive. And what this has done is it's caused a lot of uh, competition in the uh, in this market. So there's been uh, rapid acceleration in terms of the capabilities of the devices that uh, pretty much every one of you should have in your pocket right now. Uh, so, as an example. Uh, this shows the uh, performance of our, uh, what, you know, what we would call our, our high-end or our flagship uh, processors for uh, for the last uh, many years. Um, even though this says this is going over time, it's it's not. Uh, they're not like equally spaced necessarily. But uh, this this uh, there's like about seven devices shown here, spanning approximately eight years, and so you can see, you know, the uh, the rapid acceleration. You know, it's very exponential. Um, and so this, you know, led me to uh, a few years ago to create this slide. And uh, and so what this is showing is uh, laptop versus um, uh, versus mobile, uh, just a few different parameters, and just to kind of look at the trends. And what what I would use this slide uh, to do would be to make two points. One would be uh, if you squint at it a little bit, um, you, you notice that the the lines for for uh, for the laptop look somewhat um, the trends look somewhat linear. Uh, while those for mobile look uh, quite exponential. And the point wasn't to get too overly hung up on what the specific numbers were, but was to really recognize those trends. And then secondly, uh, you notice that there is a lag be uh, be be uh, between um, laptop and mobile. So if you looked at uh, what was happening with laptop, you, can, you could essentially forecast you know, a few years out, ah, this is where uh, mobile will be. And, um, and so you know, th th that those were the points I was trying to make with this. Um, and, and then, uh, as a result, you could you could look at uh, you know the PC space as as sort of an indicator of where uh, mobile will go to next. And so I've updated this uh, you know this past week really, and uh, and the the numbers don't change too much, although the the ones for mobile accelerated a little bit more, and that's that's why I, uh, I circled some things here. So on the uh, on the upper left, uh, this is really just looking at. Uh, at Total gigahertz. You know, I, I won't claim that that's necessarily uh, indicative of true performance, but it, it really is just a metric. And again, you know, the, the intent here was to look at trends, and so you see that you know there, there's been somewhat of a crossover point. 
Uh, if you look at the bottom left, you see something interesting. You, you actually have more cores in smartphones uh, in, in some markets today than you actually can get in uh, laptop computers or even your desktop computers. Um, there's uh, the, the uh, this this idea of having eight uh, eight CPUs in your smartphone is is, is here already, and uh, and it's going to become more prevalent. Um, and then if you look on the uh, bottom right, uh, you see that the uh, DDR speeds have actually converged. Uh, there was a time when uh, you, you would actually, uh, mobile DDR was always sold at a premium uh, because it was lower power, but it was always slower and an older technology, and, and, and that's, uh, that's been changing. And so now it's less obvious that you can look to the uh, PC market to provide an indication of where uh, where mobile will get to next, and so that's why uh, you know previously uh, y there was this you know what I call like this well lit path to follow that uh, that that uh, PCs provided, and uh, that's no longer the case. Um, so for the you know for 30 years the uh, the PC industry has uh, has greatly accelerated the performance of the um, you know of the CPU uh, made a lot of microarchitectural enhancements uh, the mobile market uh, has done all of that uh, virtually including all of these almost uh, over the last 10 years and so then the uh, then the question is is well what's next really. Um, what what uh, you know what what which, what will what will uh, form the next uh, leap in terms of microarchitectural performance, and it's it's not terribly clear. Although uh, you know I I would argue that uh, for mobile it started going down perhaps its own path. You know starting to uh, uh, pick up capabilities that you haven't really seen in the PC space. Um, you know this thing that I call power efficiency really is just meant to be sort of a collection of all of the things that. Uh, that are essentially routine in mobile processors that uh, that a lot of the that that are now being looked at for the more traditional markets like PCs and servers. Um, asymmetric multi-core is, is is something that's uh, is available already in, in in your mobile chips, where you basically have independent control over the uh, frequency and voltage of each of the CPUs. So it gives you a, a lot more flexibility. It's not a model where you have to program everything to be the the, the same performance level. And then big and little, so this is like the, the ARM notion of uh, big and little having higher performance cores with lower performance cores, all, um, all with the same ISA. And so, so these are you know, capabilities that you're seeing in mobile. Maybe those will get picked up in, uh, in, uh, in PC market. But, but regardless, you know, what, uh, what you start noticing is, is that uh, traditionally or historically, um, mobile's been, been uh, in a way looking towards the uh, PC market in order to uh, figure out what's next, wh wh what should they be doing uh, in terms of trying to increase their performance. And what you're starting to observe is a lot more focus uh, from the PC and server side on looking at mobile in terms of how should they improve in terms of energy efficiency. And uh, you know what I, I had recently um, uh, added uh, servers to, uh, to to my data center for the for the work that we do, and uh, it was just interesting to see that even though it had been a couple of years since we had last last done this, the performance capabilities hadn't grown, but really the the selling point or the or the newness of what we were purchasing was buying you uh, improvement in terms of power efficiency. So that was really what had changed um, over a couple of years. And so I thought that was uh, very different than what you saw historically, where you would always uh, expect uh, greater performance uh, in, in every generation. And so, uh, anyways, with this, you have to start asking: Well, if uh, laptop, uh, sorry, if um, mobile is uh, is is in a way uh, seeking to improve performance, and PCs are starting to um, try to improve in in terms of power consumption, do they somehow meet in the middle? Is there sort of a convergence in the platforms? And, uh, and, it, and if, if that's the case, will uh, improvements, you know, if, you've, if you find an improvement that you can make in one, does it automatically apply to the other? And, you know, really what will be that, that, that next improvement, you know, that, that, that next uh, leap uh, in terms of microarchitecture come from? And so, um, and so there's, you know, a number of questions. And so I'd like to talk about, you know, some of the, some of the uh, let's say, the more um, uh, popular themes or creative ideas that people in the research community have been, have been exploring. And then talk about, uh, you know, the, I, I'd like to talk about them sort of in the context of mobile and, and what to be aware of. The, uh, my intent here is not, to, uh, is not to say that, you know, any of these are 
bad ideas or anything like that. Uh, I, I wanted to sort of present this in a, let's say, slightly contentious way. Um, but really, my, my, my focus here, or my goal here, is to, um, is to look at, uh, you know, for, for uh, in the context of mobile, you know, what are things that we should be aware of so we can make it uh, more applicable for that space. So let's say we'll, we'll start with, uh, you know, our first pitfall, which will be heterogeneous computing, which, you know, we've already had a couple people talk about today. So, um, so I, I, I'm using a very broad definition uh, up here for this topic, and, uh, and so, you know, I'm having it include everything from, uh, you know, CPU plus GPU uh, to including specialized hardware engines, and um, as well as, you know, the, the, the big little idea as well. Um, and really, you know, and so I, I think everybody understands what, what, what the concept means. Um, and, you know, there are obviously a lot of challenges with this uh, that, uh, you know, in terms of managing the overheads that pertain to really any, any sort of multi-core development, you know, is issues with uh, having to uh, deal with data movement and communicating between different cores. Um, a lot of, th there are issues though that tend to often be overlooked which pertain more to like SOC complexity of, of having to deal with, uh, with the, uh, you know, these types of things. And then, um, and then dealing with resource avail availability as well as how do you map tasks onto, the, onto these cores. Uh, and then testing, you know, testing is something that I, I rarely see anybody really talk about, but, um, but we'll, we'll, we'll uh, talk briefly about that uh, today. And then, um, and then, you know, I would make the point that, uh, you know, even though I'm putting this as sort of a pitfall, this is actually something that we already have today in, in, in mobile devices. Um, you know, I kind of call this core wars because, uh, you know, the way this, this, uh, this tends to look inside of a SOC company, which, uh, which makes these types of chips, is that we have uh, different teams that, that um, you know, we have a processor team, we have a DSP team, we have a GPU team, we have separate teams that, that uh, develop um, dedicated hardware engines for video and, and, and other functions. And so when there's a new capability that's desired in a product, you, you essentially have these different teams in a way vie to, to be able to take on this new capability. And so you, you sort of have this, you know, it's, I mean, it's, you know, calling it a war, it's not, it's not uh, that, that bad, but, uh, but you do have, uh, you know, some competition that uh, gets created as a result. So the uh, so, so this diagram here, and we're going to actually see this uh, a few times in in this deck. Uh, so this is a simplified view of what a uh, a mobile SOC looks like. So this is the uh, essentially the baseband processor that's sitting inside your phone, um, and you can basically see all of the capabilities that are there. So so unlike you know let's say the uh, the chip that goes inside of a laptop or whatever, where where it's predominantly CPU oriented. Uh, for, for on the mobile side, uh, the CPU really forms a uh, you know a, a small piece, a small but important piece, you know, which is the which is the one on the uh, bottom left, the thing that's called the CPU complex. But there's a lot of other functions that that are uh, that are are, are in that uh, in that chip. In that uh, you know we call it a processor, even though it's uh, you know for for the chip as a whole, but it contains many many processors. So all the, all the dark green blocks that are up there are, are basically showing the, uh, the different types of uh, processing engines that are uh, on the die. And so if you count them all up, you see in this case, there's like 13 different instances and sev uh, of seven different types, really. And, uh, you know, I mean, they don't have terribly descriptive names, but, you know, you can kind of see tiny ones, little ones, uh, big ones. Um, and so there are, you know, a wide range of different types of processing engines inside the chip, um, you know, and, and the reason for a lot of that is, uh, it, you know, it's, it's set up in a way that uh, provides a lot of isolation so that uh, you can uh, basically have uh, pretty good, um, you know, I could say security, but it's, it's, it's really, you know, you, wa you want, uh, for example, you don't want uh, the, the processors in your multimedia engine to be, uh, to be affecting what's going on in your modem. You want these things to be able to run concurrently without any issues. Um, and so there, there's that, that aspect. The, uh, the other piece of it is the, um, is the energy efficiency. So what you do is you want to, you want to uh, select the, um, uh, the, the specific processor that's uh, best suited for, for the task that it's performing. And so that, that, that's what's enabled over here. 
Uh, the challenge with all this, of course, is, is basically all the effort that this, uh, that this creates. So uh, on the hardware side, like I said, we have, we have many teams that have to deliver all of these, uh, all of these uh, separate processors. And so it's a lot of resources to, to deliver that rather than having you know, maybe a smaller set of people focus on, on optimizing one core. And then similarly, on the software side, you have all of these, uh, these different cores to, uh, to develop software, you know, to develop the software for. And, uh, and it's not necessarily um, uh, it done any um, uh, homogenous way. So for example, um, you know, this, this is intended to uh, give, you, give you a view, even though you can't quite maybe make out all the words on here, but, but the idea is to show uh, all of the different tool sets that are needed to program each of the different cores. And so, you know, whether you're programming something for the GPU, for the DSP, for the CPU, or, or other pieces, it, it's like it's a, it's a completely different um, uh, programming environment that's needed. And so if, you, um, you know, so if you have a function that you want to implement on one type of core, and then maybe later on, on, on the next generation, move it to another type of core, it's, it's not that trivial. It's not just a matter of having to pick up the domain knowledge for, for that function, but you now have to pick up a whole new programming environment and, and everything else. So it, uh, it, it creates, uh, let's say, a lot of work for, um, uh, for the software folks. And so th this could lead you down the path of, well, instead of having all of these dissimilar cores, you know, might it make sense to essentially have more of a, uh, a flexible solution? You know, essentially, uh, you know, what I'm trying to show here, and it's not terribly good, uh, terribly good diagram, but, but imagine like in the upper left that you have um, these hardware resources. So let's say it's like four, you know, essentially little, little type cores, and that you have the ability then on the upper right to combine them pairwise to give you, uh, instead of like four tiny, tiny CPUs, you can combine them to create two uh, medium type CPUs. And then the bottom left, maybe you have one medium and then two little, type, uh, two little or tiny, sorry. And then in the bottom right, you can combine all the resources into one. And so this is, this is more like the, uh, the core fusion idea. Um, but the idea is to have a, uh, a single ISA and, uh, and then try to keep things as, uh, as much in place as po uh, the data and state as much in place as possible uh, so that uh, you're not uh, spending a lot of energy moving stuff around. And so, uh, you know, there's a, there's a fair amount of research looking at different ways to achieve uh, these types of capabilities. Um, and then, uh, but, you know, it's, it's not necessarily a panacea either. It, uh, it, it does create its own set of challenges. And, um, and you know, it pushes more of the, uh, the issues up a, up a level to the SOC, um, as well as to, uh, to software trying to manage these resources. And then from the software side, uh, we could also um, basically follow the, uh, the model that, uh, that is uh, prevalent today in Android, where um, you, know, you, you kind of look at it being more uh, flexible software. So if you kind of look at the path on the left, you, know, you have something that is ISA agnostic that uh, you know, basically gets um, uh, recompiled in some way, whether this is uh, um, dynamic compilation or install time com uh, compilation. And, uh, and then basically you can then drive the, uh, the specific hardware engines that you have on, 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 uh, on, on your die. Um, and so this is uh, you know, another po possibility, but also you know, isn't, isn't uh, necessarily the, um, the best solution overall since there's uh, always concerns about uh, optimization efficiency. Uh, and then there's still the issue of trying to uh, test, uh, test this stuff um, And so um, I had mentioned earlier about uh, a concern with uh, this, this topic of task mapping. And so, you know, so if you imagine that you have a, uh, you know, you have this complex chip with lots of different processors and you have uh, a particular function that you want to run, do you always run that function on the same core or is it really, or, or does the core that you want it to run on depend on what else is running in the system at the same time? So for example, if you, if you had a function that needed, let's say a couple uh, hundred megahertz extra in terms of a processor, do you basically jack up the performance of you know, your main core that's there or do you turn on a, um, a, another core, uh, maybe a, a more energy efficient core in your system? And does the answer to that depend on what else is already going on? And um, and so I you know I would argue it, it probably does uh, you know depending on what your goals are you, you may want to have that flexibility. There's also uh, you know concern of you know uh, so if you go with a, a mode where you're basically static 
uh, statically mapping you know, tasks to different cores, you, know, you, you do lose some flexibility, particularly when there's concurrency issues. So if you want to, uh, you know, if you have something that uh, you desire to run on your GPU, but your GPU is busy doing you know, what GPUs are meant to do, uh, graphics-oriented stuff, what do you do in that case? Do you end up uh, basically stalling, uh, the, you know, stalling uh, that, new, that new app that you're trying to run, or do you end up uh, sort of uh, sending it off and running it on the uh, more uh, general purpose process? Or, um, in the dynamic mapping case, that would be really the answer is where you just kind of you know, flexibly um, uh, move things around based on what's available. And, uh, but you know, this, this does create a lot of issues because now you have to, uh, uh, you know, before you can release a product, you've got to be able to test you know, the, the, these different functions running on all the possible places it can possibly run at. And, uh, and the other complexity that it creates is, is um, you know, you can't really look at it as that, you know, you're, you're delivering just one single product. In our case, you know, we, we deliver a roadmap of, uh, of, uh, of chips, you know, from low end through high end. Um, you know, this is uh, somewhat simplified. And so what I'm showing here is kind of like what may change, might change, you know, in terms of the, that block level diagram, in terms of the processing capabilities as you go from like a high end to a low end part. And uh, I highlight in red sort of where, where the differences come. But you can see that, you know, obviously there's differences in the counts of the processors, but there could also be differences in terms of whether a particular function is implemented in hardware or in software. And, uh, and so all of this then uh, uh, creates problems because you're, you know, if, you're, if you're developing software for this, do you end up developing software uh, exclusively for the high-end part and then have another team deliver software exclusively for the mid-end part? And again, a third team to deliver software exclusively for the low-end part? Or is there a way to be able to sort of leverage all of that to be able to deliver a more um, sort of a, a superset of a solution that can be applicable to your entire roadmap? you know, ma mainly for the purposes of trying to reuse your resources and... All right, so uh, the second pitfall is on uh, performance scaling and multi-core. Um, so the, uh, the figure that's on here, people are probably familiar with, um, you know, so th this basically uh, came out about, uh, let's say about 10 years ago. This was when we were at the peak of, uh, of single thread performance for, uh, for PCs. And this is where people were envisioning that, well, if we kept uh, going further uh, beyond, the, beyond uh, what Pentium was at the time, uh, the power density was going to approach that of, you know, and people used examples like nuclear reactors and rocket nozzles and the su surface of the sun, you know, and so, so it created, you know, a lot of, a lot of discussion and talk at the time. Uh, and, you know, and obviously this didn't really come to pass because what, what happened was that, uh, you know, the direct, you know, people shifted over to the direction of going into multi-core, which conveniently is the talk for today. So, uh, and so what we've seen now is that uh, smartphones have also went down this path. So, um, you know, today uh, you, you're, you're up to eight, eight uh, CPUs inside of your, uh, your smartphone. And, uh, you know, and there's a question of, well, will this continue growing? You know, I mean, people never thought that you'd need more than two, maybe four on the PC side. Somehow people have uh, managed to justify needing more than that for, you know, this small little device that fits in your pocket. So. Uh, but, you know, if, if there's, you know, the obvious questions, you know, do these cores serve a purpose? And, uh, you know, and, and can you actually do anything, you know, with them there? So um, what I'll show you is here's some data. This is maybe about a year old. And so what this does is it's looking at, uh, various applications on the left, and uh, the columns here are showing the percentage of time that a particular number of cores are active. So the, the, this would be reflecting the CPUs that were in that bottom left of the figure that I showed before, that thing that was called the CPU complex. So this is obviously a, a four-core, um, you know, what we would call a four-core uh, um, SOC. And, uh, and so what you see is that the... Um, a lot of the time, uh, none of the cores are active, which is, you know, you might say, well, isn't that bad? No, that's actually a good thing. That means that, um, you know, you know you, th if there's nothing to do, you really want the cores to be off in order to save power. So, so that happens a lot of the time, which is good. And then you see a lot of, uh, a lot of the remaining time is, is used uh, with only one core being active, and then sometimes, you know, less frequently, two cores being active, and then progressively less. And it's uh, pretty rare that you see all four cores being used. 
Um, but there is, you know, one example here with the camera capture where you do see that it is actively used, and um, you know, and if 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 that fourth core wasn't there, it would just you know slow down your capabilities um, for that particular application. And so, um, you know, so one of the questions, and then this was why I made the point that this this was uh, data that was collected about a year ago, was that at that time um, most phones that were uh, available were actually dual core, and so the question is, you know, how much of this is a chicken and egg problem? You know, is if if uh, if people felt that well, two cores is really what what everybody's going to have. Do I develop my software really intending for there to be uh, just two cores? Uh, now that their four cores are prevalent, do I will will we start seeing this shifting towards the right? Uh, and now, well, I guess even more recent, if there's eight cores available, will we will we start seeing this? Uh, will I be able to extend this table? So uh, I, I don't have those answers quite yet, but. Um, but uh, some other data that uh, we've collected is looking at, um, you know, are, are there threads that are available uh, to run on the other cores uh, if, if they were there? And so what this, this plot is looking at is uh, it has uh, different package names along the bottom. Uh, so think of it as different applications along the bottom. And then um, there's two axes. Uh, so on the left side, it's looking at the maximum number of threads uh, that there were available to run at any point during the application. So if there was even just one instant of time where there were uh, you know, a high number of threads, and that's the number that's going to be shown there. The, um, the axis on the right is showing what the average number of runnable threads was over the lifetime of that application. And that also includes the case where it has nothing to do and would therefore be zero. Uh, and so uh, what you can see from this is that uh, the average, since it's kind of it's sorted by the average, um, you know there are a lot of applications which really have very very little to run, and then there are some applications which can keep two cores uh, busy. Um, and then in terms of the max, you can see the max actually peaks for like one of the apps somewhere above 30, which means that hey, it had at least at some point in time, it had uh, thir 30 threads to to run. Um, but you know, with the average being low, it uh, it suggests that uh, you know that was obviously a, a very uh, very brief. And so then the question is is well, how how do we address this? You know, I mean, the hardware's there. I mean, it's it's already you know, I mean, you already have it in your pocket. It's it, this is not a question of should we add it or or whatever. I mean, it's there already, and so. I guess I look at it as well. How do we make use of it? And um, you know, one one of the uh, you know I guess well-known problems is that uh, this stuff is difficult to program. You know, and so you know th there have been a number of frameworks that have been developed to to ease that process. Um, I, I don't know if they've went far enough in terms of making it simple. Um, I think one of the perhaps bigger challenges that there are for the mobile space is that. You're dealing with, you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of, of developers, or I mean, if even maybe worse still, it's hundreds of thousands of different little little companies or little, you know, uh, individuals who release apps. And so, how do you get all of them to, or many of them, to, uh, you know, sort of learn the, the these frameworks in order to be able to um, uh, program these types of devices? And then um, there's the challenge of, you know, what, what should really be the, the right core mix on these devices? Um, you know, if, uh, I mean, you'll, if you start looking around at what's available in, 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 in your smartphones today, you'll see some, some have, you know, maybe they'll have four high-end cores, some might have four high-end, four or low-end, some might have eight low-end cores. You know, wh what is that right mix? What, what can developers count on uh, being there uh, when they program it? And, um, and so you might also argue, well, d aren't these really the same problems that exist in the in the PC market as well? You know, they, I mean, the, the, there was this idea that PC space would also kind of go go down this path of gr uh, increasing core counts, but didn't quite uh, quite get beyond four. Um, but uh, you know, I'd say maybe some of the differences are that uh, the mobile space already has, uh, let's say, embraced this this concept of uh, heterogeneity, not just in terms of having these uh, dissimilar types of processors, but even just in in uh, even for cores that are of the same ISA, having different types of them uh, on the same platform that you can program um, uh, that you can use collectively. And then uh, another uh, aspect that's different that could perhaps provide a solution is that much of the code is uh, dynamically generated that's on, on your mobile, pro mobile processors. 
Um, and so that you know provides you another avenue to perhaps uh, take advantage of the hardware that's there. All right, and now, uh, so here I'm including the figure that I think uh, Stefano said uh, was, was, was kind of summarizing earlier on. Um, so, you know, the gist here, as uh, I think everybody's aware, is that, um, you know, Moore's Law has, you know, been giving us increasing transistor counts, but Denard scaling hasn't been keeping up. And, uh, and so as a result, um, we, uh, you know, we have this sort of uh, discrepancy, this gap uh, that, 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 that's created. And so we can pile in more transistors into a piece of silicon. Um, however, if you have a thermal limit in terms of what you can actually um, uh, run, you, it means that you can't really run everything you know, as, as you go to the next generation. Uh, presumably, you would end up having to gate more things off or kind of essentially time multiplex the functions uh, that are running. And so the notion is then that, well, if that's the case, uh, why not um, you know, essentially use those extra transistors, which are becoming cheaper and cheaper over time, to uh, focus on um, energy efficiency, uh, making more energy efficient cores, um, or adding hardware accelerators. But uh, you know, the premise behind this, though, is that the, uh, the is that the cost of the silicon is 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 really cheap, and and so that's why I kind of highlight this as a question because, you know, is does this really apply to mobile? So here, what I show is uh, this is this is a. Um, a uh, plot over time showing uh, uh, high-end uh, SOC areas. Um, this is all normalized, so it's basically normalized to what it was back in 2002. And, uh, and so this, this is not um, scaling based on, uh, on, um, on process technology or anything. This is showing the actual raw, raw die sizes in terms of, you know, you can think of it in terms of what's the, the effective number of millimeters. And, and so what you notice is, I mean, there's a fair amount of um, variability in the numbers, but, but you notice there's actually tends to be somewhat of an upward trend. In other words, the, um, uh, the die sizes actually are getting larger over time, despite the fact that Moore's Law allows you to pile in more stuff in, in, into the die. You might expect to see the, the trend go downwards or perhaps uh, stay flat, but, um, but with all of the uh, competition for the space, basically there's a lot of... Um, uh, a, a high need to be able to pile in more features. There's always a, uh, a desire to, uh, you know, figure out what's the what's the f needed functionality, some some way to differentiate your part. And so there's always a, uh, you know, if, if essentially if there's transistors that are available to do something, you want to use them to put in to add in a new feature, not to necessarily just simply um, uh, make uh, an existing feature more uh, energy efficient. And so then uh, the question is: Is uh, you know, don't don't we hit a thermal limit? I mean, are we are we not uh, let's say bogged down by by the by the um, dilemma I proposed on the previous slide? So um, this is uh, you know basically the various functions that you have on your mobile SOC, and uh, and really uh, pretty much all of these have kind of like their own uh, our own uh, separate uh, power supply and everything. And there's actually a lot of focus on energy efficiency uh, right from the outset. And all those functions basically allow you to uh, do all of these different types of features. And one thing that's interesting is that uh, a lot of these features, while they can run concurrently, you know, so for example, you want to be able to, uh, you know, do web browsing while you're listening to music, while you're potentially even receiving a phone call. Um, a lot, many of these features uh, are not consuming, you know, let's say 100% of your, um, uh, are not active 100% of the time. Many of the features really are f uh, fairly bursty. Um, and so I give like an example here that, you know, for example, modem and audio functions, you know, they tend to be somewhat periodic. You know, they kind of wake up, do, a, do, do some work, and then kind of go to sleep for a period of time. And so what this allows you to do is, is essentially try to fill in you know, the gaps when uh, some functions aren't uh, active with other functions. And, uh, and so it makes it so that you're not really dealing with this uh, situation where everything is worst case, all piling up on top of each other. And so this uh, gives you uh, sort of a pictorial view of that. Um, this example here is showing um, basically running something that's a, an app that's both CPU and GPU intensive. And you know, since uh, your mobile device really is more UI oriented, not compute oriented, it um, 
you know, that it, I, I think that's you know part of the reason why you see a lot of the um, uh, the bursty nature here, and uh, and so you know, I, in a way, you can um, you know you can see you know you can visibly see where all the uh, the gaps are that you could you know uh, intersperse other um, uh, other compute uh, if if you wish. And so, uh, you know, uh, there, there is um, limited uh, temperature-based throttling that occurs on, on these devices, but uh, I would contend it's not, um, it, it's to deal more with the, um, uh, the exception rather than the norm. You know, it's, it's the case where you are, you happen to be in a scenario which, you know, it's generally fairly brief where you do have a lot of uh, high concurrency that you may have, you know, where, where, where it may need to start uh, scaling back. But it's uh, but it's not typically the um, having to kick in for for normal use. Yep. All right. Well, since Doug was using this earlier, I'm sure this one works well, right? So. All right. So, uh, so basically, the uh, implications of this, um, you know, I, I guess I'm saying that we can't really treat silicon as free yet. Um, each of the functions that we have on there, uh, you know, basically, anytime somebody wants to add something to the die, uh, we say that you know it kind of needs to earn its place uh, on there. And um, you know, and and obviously, you know, I'm, I'm I'm not saying not to do a good job with power management and so forth. I mean, we obviously we do. Um, you know, these are energy constrained devices. So um, uh, and then last point is just that uh, you need to design for the common case, not uh, not trying to uh, over design it to deal with the uh, the extremes. And so uh, this topic of um, of power, you know, I kind of felt like it deserved its own section. I had uh, originally intended to start start trying to cover things like um, uh, different trade-offs that people do for power versus performance and all that. Um, you know, we can talk a little bit about that, uh, but I, I thought I'd try to use this to, you know, get, provide some info, some data on, uh, you know, kind of what's observed inside of a mobile device. So what this table shows here is um, you can look at it as uh, this is just the main CPU. So if you remember the um, table from earlier where we're showing the percentage of time diff a different count of CPUs was being used, that's that f the, the column that had one CPU there, think of it as this is what's showing the specific frequency that it's set to. The, uh, the other pr uh, processors that are in there could be set to different frequencies because, as I mentioned, each of the, uh, the main CPUs can be set to an independent frequency and voltage. So, um, and, th and then we see uh, the columns are different applications. And so this kind of gives you a sense of, of um, you know, how often over time, so how often uh, at the, the main CPU is at, a, is at a particular frequency setting for a particular application. And, uh, and so what you might immediately observe is that, you know, there's a wide uh, dynamic range in terms of the frequencies, right? Uh, you know, this, this doesn't even show the zero case, right? So the zero case would be another, another one that's there. So this is showing only when the CPU is actually active. And so when it's active, you have a range, uh, you know, it's almost a factor of 10 in terms of the, uh, of the frequencies uh, that, that it can be. And, uh, and then the other thing you might notice is that uh, a lot of the time it's, it's spent actually at the lowest frequency bin, which, you know, again, I would contend is a good thing because it is an energy constrained device. And so if there's really little to do, you want it to do little. Um, and that the high frequency ones don't get used that often, but they do get used. And, and I do think that's important because uh, you can imagine that if you uh, started removing, you know, the higher frequency um, uh, settings from the device, um, how much more the numbers would have to grow, uh, you know, if, if for example, you, you lost, let's say, the, 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 let's say the bottom two here, um, you know, how much more the, um, uh, the next highest frequency bin would have to grow in order to sort of compensate uh, for it. So, um, uh, in order to take advantage of this, um, you know, sort of the, the rich set of frequencies and, and the capabilities of, of these processors, um, as I've mentioned before, uh, the, 
there's a separate uh, power domain for each, and that's what this figure is showing. The, the different color codes here um, basically reflect uh, the different power domains that that are available. So these are you know independently programmable uh, voltage um, domains uh, for the SOC. And so you could see, you know, obviously the four CPUs each have each have their own. DSP has its own. And so there's, uh, you know, a lot of uh, granularity um, uh, with this. Uh, overlaid on top of that, uh, the memories also get their own um, uh, separate power domain. And in truth, um, parts of the various rest of the block should also be colored that that darkish blue as well. But I didn't want to make it too uh, overly complex. And then, uh, even though most of the die you see is is um, is with the same voltage supply, it's actually a little more complicated than that because all of those things that are now um, cross hatched are um, actually uh, have the ability to be independently gated uh, as well. So, for example, if you uh, don't need, let's say, the audio core, you could actually power gate that audio core independent of uh, of everything else. And so you can see there's uh, it, there's uh, you know a fair amount of uh, flexibility. Um, in the die, and really, you know, the notion here is that you want to be able to uh, program, you know, each of these cores, uh, you know, to the lowest voltage needed to uh, to achieve the particular frequency that you need to meet your performance requirement. And so that's that's really the notion here. This is you know how how we minimize ener energy. So I had mentioned before um, that the that the, the that the memory. Um, that the uh, the memories had their own supply, and the and the reason for that is that if you um, if you basically assume that normally you run at 0.75 volts, and you say, okay, that's that's my normalized delay, that's the point at which uh, at which um, you know I, I normally run at. If you start um, start scaling uh, the voltage down, uh, let's say you just scale it down to 0.5 volts, what you notice is the, is that the logic delay actually grows by a factor of 10. However, the uh, memory delay grows by a factor of 350. And so if you actually kept these things on the same voltage supply, you'd be very much limited by the performance of your memory. You wouldn't be able to lower your voltage as much. And uh, you wouldn't be able to save as much energy. And so this, this provides you flexibility. And so there's a lot of hardware challenges with all this. And uh, you know, I'm not going to go through, through all of these things. But you know, having separate regulators and having to design each of the regulators to support this wide dynamic range. Um, and then there's just you know, a lot of issues even at the uh, SOC level, you know, having, having individual blocks that uh, can be power gated and then suddenly powered on. It, uh, you know, it, there, there are um, issues that it can create where you can essentially create noise that, are, that, are, that, uh, that is visible to, uh, to adjacent blocks. And so just to give you one example of uh, one of the things that, uh, the, one of the challenges that we have. Again, this is, uh, you know, the, the, the block diagram from earlier. Um, so the SOC die, normally it's uh, packaged as a flip, flip chip type of device. In order to feed uh, signals and power and grounds to it from the board, there's basically a layer of bumps that's, uh, that's, that's put on there. And that's where everything feeds through in order to get to the die. And so if you had a single voltage supply for the entire die, you could have a, um, uh, you know, sort of an array that looks like this. That's nice and straightforward. You could say it looks very stable, very solid. But because we have separate voltage domains for everything, you know, they're color coded here, it uh, gets, you know, things start to break up a little bit. And, um, and so it's not as, let's say, as robust as, as uh, it might otherwise be. And in truth, it actually gets a lot more complicated than this. It gets a lot more, uh, you know, uh, holy, let's say, because uh, in truth, you're also going to have other types of signals, signal IO and so forth, that are also going to be interspersed with this. And, uh, and so that's just, you know, an example of one of the challenges that we have. And then from uh, you know the uh, the non-hardware stuff essentially, uh, there's uh, you know this you know this slide alone you know we could do a whole talk on for for an hour or so you know I'm, I'm not I'm not going to go through all of this but but this basically pertains to all of the algorithms and so forth that you do to manage power uh, inside your SOC and you know how you do the different uh, different trade-offs. And so now, now we get to uh, the fifth pitfall, uh, which is really pertaining to optimization and workloads. And so, um, you know, you may, uh, you may or may not be surprised to learn that uh, even for mobile SOCs, uh, for the mobile processors, we we use you know many of the conventional benchmarks that are used for the other markets. 
And uh, this may seem odd, you know, because I, you know, what I did is I, I put down um, a couple of the uh, definitions for these um, for these benchmarks, just taken straight from Wikipedia. And so you could see, like, the first one for Spec 2006. You know, I mean, it's denoted specifically as a server benchmark. You know, yet we use it, uh, you know, for for assessing the performance of our uh, mobile uh, processors. And uh, you know, and then dry stone. I mean, you look at how old dry stone is, and you know the what it was based off of, the types of workloads it was based off of. And regardless, in both cases, um, you know, mob you know the the advent of mobile apps and everything, even smartphones has uh, you know is newer than uh, newer than this. And so that might be a sign that hey, the uh, the people who created these benchmarks were very uh, forward looking to create something that was uh, still applicable to this day. That's that's the optimistic point of view, um, and so. Uh, but you know, there are uh, things to consider that uh, make mobile very different uh, than uh, what these benchmarks were originally created to uh, to test. And so here's sort of a, a set of the um, uh, differences that are there, and uh, you know, and and so we'll we'll talk a little bit about uh, these. So. Uh, Besides platform differences, there's also uh, differences in terms of like the the workloads, and so I wanted to show an example of of uh, you know four you know this is a four core um, uh, chip that's running a game, so this is a gaming application, and I just kind of took a snippet, and so you can see time on the bottom, and and uh, initially I had these all overlaid, but you know when they're overlaid on the same uh, same set of axes, you can't really uh, distinguish them. And so what I wanted to show here was that uh, you know you can see the four CPUs they do get used. You see how much uh, variation there is in terms of the the frequency settings for each, uh, corresponding to uh, each possible frequency for each of the CPUs is a different voltage. And so you know the voltage for each uh, CPU is changing each time the uh, the frequency changes for it as well. And so you can see you get a sense of the the, the wide variation in terms of the uh, performance that's expected, and you know just how dynamic it is. You know it's continuously changing, uh, even just over the uh, you know this is a very brief amount of time, right? I mean this is showing approximately you know about three seconds of activity, and. Um, and so, you know, I had mentioned earlier that, uh, you know, one of the big differences is that there is a fair amount of dynamic code, uh, or, you know, there's like uh, Dalvik byte code. So, so a lot of that, you know, it's, it's ISA agnostic, and so it gets uh, recompiled, you know, on the target. Um, there's a, you know, diverse set of uh, developers for this stuff. And, and the reason I make that point is that, you know, if I look at, uh, you know, like what I run on my laptop, for example, uh, you know, normally I'll have like Chrome and I'll have pretty much like about half a dozen Microsoft applications on there. And so you could say, hey, I, you, you have a bunch of stuff running concurrently on, on your laptop. But the reality is that pretty much all of it is, is provided by a single developer and, well, plus, plus one, one exception. On the other hand, if I look at my mobile phone, the, uh, you know, I have like about, you know, uh, a couple dozen things that are cu concurrently running, you know, from, from apps to, uh, you know, to kind of, uh, you know, count my steps, you know, so I got like stuff from Samsung, stuff from uh, many things from Google on here. I got, uh, you know, ho home automation app. I got uh, things for my, uh, you know, checking in at the airport and the hotel reservations, tracking the uh, my wine cellar contents, you know. All of these things are done by, you know, different different developers. And the reason I make this point is that, um, is that it's not like these developers all get together to try to test their stuff concurrently, right? I mean, we're, we're really the, the test bed for that where we're running this stuff and hoping that these things don't collide in some, uh, in some unforeseen way. And so that, that, that's, uh, that's what makes it uh, very different for, for mobile than it is for, uh, for laptop. And so, uh, so what we do on, on mobile, you know, so I, I showed uh, two, you know, benchmarks I had mentioned before, sort of examples. But in truth, what we do is we actually look at a wide range of, uh, of benchmarks. You know, we're very, uh, you know, all, all inclusive uh, in, in terms of our, our attitude towards that. And um, and so you know you can you see the various names up above, and basically we look at things that are you know some of them are CPU centric, some of them are GPU centric, some of them really look at the SOC as a whole, and you know and obviously that's because we're not we're not selling just um, just a CPU, we're selling you know uh, the, the whole package of uh, of ca uh, features and capabilities. <coughs> and so uh, one thing that's interesting is that uh, the uh, mobile OS vendors, as well as the, um, uh, the handset manufacturers, some of them have come up with 
uh, sort of additional uh, requirements, additional metrics that we can use to optimize our, our, our platforms. And, uh, and so some of these are like things like application startup requirements. You know, how, how long does it take when you start up an app till it actually comes up to the main screen? And, and there's actually a fair amount of effort that happens, that, not necessarily by the developers, but actually by companies like us that provide the underlying platform to, to accelerate uh, capabilities like that. Because obviously, you know, a user gets very frustrated if they have to wait, you know, half a second for something to show up on their screen. You know, they want it, you know, instantaneously. So. Uh, and then there's just even general responsiveness requirements. You know, if you bring up a menu in an app, how quickly does that occur? You know, the, a lot of that is functionality that's built into Android or you know the whatever the particular mobile OS is. And uh, but the, the and so as a result, uh, you know, a company like us, we have control over that to some degree, and so we can try to accelerate um, uh, those types of capabilities. And then the last one, which is an interesting one, is is these things we call uh, uh, days of use uh, tests. And, uh, and so I'll show you an example here. Um, I'm not sure how visible this is, but what, what this basically attempts to do is, is uh, weight or prioritize you know, the, uh, the different applications that a person uses over a typical day. And so, for example, what this will show you is that over a typical day, a person will do, uh, spend 4% of their time gaming, 14% of their time doing, you know, internet stuff, 10% doing social networking, et cetera, et cetera. And you see a big, big chunk where they're not really doing anything, right? So that's, that's idle. Across many users? Or? This is across many users, yep. So this is, this is the average across many users. It could be for a particular market. I, actually, I would guarantee you this is for a very specific market. And, um, and so obviously this will d uh, depend on the, the specific demographic and, and all that. But my point here is that uh, these will be, you know, we can get this type of information and, and, and we can use this then. Uh, a lot of times this is used by us to um, assess the, uh, the, the reason it's called a days of use is to assess the, how, long, how many days can you go, uh, can, can, can your phone last essentially, you know, on a single uh, charge and uh, at, by, by uh, doing this type of work. And, uh, but this also provides you know, further insight beyond that because it gives you an indication of, well, how much time is being spent in each of these categories and therefore, you know, well, how, where should I really focus my, my effort in terms of uh, optimizing? You know, should I really optimize gaming if that's really only 4% or should I optimize you know, one, of the, one of these other categories? And so then the uh, question is, is okay, so what, what can we do, you know, ba based on this to improve? And, uh, and so, you know, one of the points I wanted to make was that the, um, you know, where, you know, the, the thing that's in your, in your smartphone is not just a CPU, it's really, it's a whole SOC with a lot of functionality capabilities. So, um, uh, and that the performance of your CPU isn't just the CPU by itself, but is, a f uh, is you know, dependent on everything else. So if, you, if all those other engines are doing a lot of stuff, you can have the world's greatest CPU, but it may still be uh, you know, sharing the same memory bandwidth as everything else that's running, in, in, r running on the SOC. Um, we, uh, you know, th there are a lot of benchmarks that are out there, and it would be good uh, to see how these map to actual real-world use cases for mobile. And uh, and then you know maybe use a strategy like this the the do view D, days of use uh, type weights to you know sort of uh, find a way to um, uh, figure out how to combine different benchmarks to to come up with uh, good metrics for mobile. And then uh, you know we should make sure to consider energy and power you know because uh, you know so much of the focus of you know if I look at a lot of the computer architecture papers they really are on how do I eke out just a little bit more performance. Um, but the truth is, is that, you know, power is very important, you know, as, as I tried to show before. And, uh, you know, and then, I, you know, just a couple more things, just uh, data sets. I, I didn't really talk about this uh, in, in the talk, but, you know, the, there's reference data sets for some of the benchmarks, but, you know, are they applicable to mobile? And does that make a difference in terms of the performance that you see? And, uh, and so that, that should also be uh, considered. And then, and then somehow one has to look at uh, application concurrency. Um, there's been previous work that's been, been published showing you know, the, the effect of just taking you know, conventional benchmarks and running pairs of them and seeing what a, uh, you know, how certain pairs can create really major slowdowns uh, overall. And so how, how do you account for that in a, on a platform, which really you, you are doing a lot of uh, concurrent applications. And so um, to summarize here, 
you know, what I uh, wanted to convey, you know, was, was that, you know, mobile's, you know, a very interesting platform. There's a lot of challenges with it. Um, you know, I didn't, I, uh, you know, didn't want to, you know, give, give the sense that, um, that, uh, you know, the different topics that I'm, that I, that I was talking about are things that are bad or shouldn't be looked at. I, in fact, I think that they, they're, they're very interesting. Um, a lot of the research there tends to be very PC focused or server focused. And, and so I think it would be good to, uh, consider mobile, um, w when you're looking at some of these ideas. And I think there's a lot of opportunities um, uh, available. You know, this is a uh, you know a platform with billions of users. You know, there's uh, you know a million plus apps that are out there. Even just if you pick one of the uh, one of the major mobile OS uh, vendors, and so there's a lot of a lot of stuff that's out there that's available for people. Um, and so I think there's a number of areas that uh, you know the the research community can contribute towards, and you know, and ultimately you 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 have the opportunity to uh, see your work impact you know billions of people. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so we have time for a few questions. Ah, oh, it's a quiet audience today. That's good. Mm -hmm. uh, there is one. Back there, if you can. In the meantime, le can I say something about benchmarking? Sure. I think it would be great if you guys drove the development of a benchmark suite that reflects the mobile space. Yeah, so it's so much harder for academia to pick Angry Birds and this and this and call it representative mm -hmm. than you guys telling us this is what's mm -hmm. representative. And if you can find some open source apps and give them out and say this is representative mobile workload, I think that would be fantastic. So it's something that... I, I, I agree. Uh, there is one that uh, Qualcomm makes available that's uh, called Velamo. It's not specific to the CPU. It's more mm -hmm. meant as a SOC type of benchmark. But I, I, I understand your point, you know, that... Uh, but understood. Mm. Yep, but mm. something could be done in collaboration with other mm -hmm. companies, for example, ARM, that they're promoting the Gem 5 simulator. Mm -hmm. If you just gave a workload for that, that's yep. that's the way to go for academia. Okay, yep. sure. Um, yeah, quick question. Thanks a lot for the talk. Um, I was wondering about your DOU metric uh, because it was percent of time, and I was wondering if it DOU met, made more sense as a percent of energy consumption, uh, considering you were looking at um, the amount of applications you were using without the plug, right? Um, so I did, why were you using, looking at time and not energy consumption? Because you're <clears throat> Wouldn't it change drastically? Like your game yeah. at four percent of the time would could take fifty, sixty percent. Correct, correct, correct. So the, uh, the the pie chart was intended to show time performing each of those functions, and the way that we we often use that is to determine what's the total energy consumed over a day. And so what we'll do is we'll say, okay, so if a person is spending, so you say, okay, uh, I, I don't remember the, exa the the absolute number of hours, but there's an absolute number of hours of, of uh, like awake time that corresponds to a person, you know, doing these things. And so let's say it's 12 hours, for example. And so you'd say, okay, 4% of that 12 hours they're spending doing gaming. How, how, what's the energy uh, consumption uh, corresponding to that? And we'll do that for each of those categories. And then that'll come up with a total energy cost for the day. And then based on your battery size, you can then compute how many days of, uh, will it last. And so that, that's how it's looked at. But you can do what you're saying, which is um, create essentially a pie, pie chart that shows what's the uh, corresponding percentages of energy for each of the categories. David, thanks for the really interesting talk. Uh, so thanks, your first you. slide was fascinating, showing the trends uh, of mobile catching up to laptop and desktop, and mm -hmm. I've never seen that before. Do you have any thoughts about at what point the volumes for mobile, if you look at the relative growth rates, are so high that they would start driving architecture? I mean, you know, they're catching up and maybe, but any, any thoughts about that? You know, are the volumes, if you're 10x the volume, then you know, features are going to migrate up, not not down. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I would argue that the volumes are already there. It's uh, you know, it's kind of a question I have for the community at large. Is all right. So the volumes are there. It's uh, it's a very um, prevalent uh, type of platform. Uh, why why aren't people more focused on it? And uh, and I think the the answers often come that uh, part of it is inertial. Part of it is that the tools are already there for a lot of the um, the x86 work that's done. Um, and you know, part of it could be funding. It could be a number of things. So, 
Um, but, you know, I, I think this is, you know, obviously, you know, being from Qualcomm, this is where I think it's at. And, uh, and so, you know, I, I do think it would uh, behoove a lot of us to, uh, to explore this space more. And uh, is there anybody else? I can ask one, one more question. So you talked about um, having this um, uh, different types of course and how difficult that is, although we do have it mm -hmm. right now. And maybe we should switch to something like core fusion, where you have one type, and then you can. Just a suggestion. It's just a possible. Sure, it, yeah. it's mm -hmm. a very interesting. Uh, mm -hmm. That's not my question. Doesn't go directly there. What I want to ask you, and then you know, power gating things on and off, but you haven't really talked about the memory system, and mm -hmm. there is a lot of memory on these devices. Correct. Yeah. Is there any idea of doing something like this for memory? Do we want to turn memory off, um, on, modify it? change it or are yeah. you guys thinking about I, I, like I that? agree I had thought about putting something on memory in, in the deck and I, I was already um, I was already like at about an hour and 20 minutes and had to scale back so I didn't uh, I decided not to add another topic because I, I felt memory itself probably would deserve its whole talk uh, unto itself um, so there are already differences that exist today with uh, like mobile DDR versus PC DDR. So, so there are some inherent differences which are intended to address things uh, that, that are more pertaining to energy. So there's different sleep states and so forth uh, available there. So there, there is different flexibility there, but you might also be thinking about, well, are the solutions for, you know, sort of memory going forward, or could they be different for, for mobile, um, you know, some of these uh, hybrid memory architectures and so forth. And, and I think a lot of that is ve definitely very uh, fertile space to, to explore. Um, I, don't, I don't claim to have answers there. One, one, one thing to be cognizant of though is just like in the PC world cost is definitely very important and so uh, coming up uh, deriving some uh, f uh, let's say a very fancy scheme that is highly customized and uh, it will not and is not prevalent um, will be expensive and that may make uh, adoptions very uh, very difficult so whatever gets uh, developed has to be done so in a way that the industry at large uh, adopts it um, in order to keep the uh, the cost down, but uh, but I would say that memory is certainly um, uh, let's say to a degree almost more important from the perspective of uh, from cost than uh, than on the PC side. I think a, a lot of folks believe that even like uh, from some of the talks yesterday, you know, memory is memory is essentially free. There's more more than more than enough of it available. Uh, that's not really viewed as the case for mobile. Um, you know, we we actually really. Uh, we do a lot of work, you know, we kind of jump through hoops in order to, to do things in order to reduce our code base so that we can fit into the next smaller size of memory on the device because you can save a lot of cost that way. I see. Uh, a related question, what about the on-chip memory? Uh, level 1, cast level mm -hmm. 2, level 3. Yep. Do we resize them? Do we do anything with them? Do we... Uh, switch them off, manage them, or yep. it's not a concern. Yeah, so so there is certainly flexibility in terms of being able to power collapse uh, the, the, these different cache levels, um, and uh, you know in terms of the sizing, you know I I, I suspect and it's, I I haven't looked at what the the sizes are on x86 recently, but it's it, the the effort or the, the analysis for how those are sized for mobile devices is done specifically for mobile chips and mobile applications. And it's not based on taking what, what numbers exist for x86. So, so the analysis is highly tuned for what's needed for mobile. So um, I guess that the, we can say uh, a kind of a convergence in between the uh, evolution of the hardware in the mobile, uh, especially thinking about the tablet evolution and and um, the PC, or at least in the traditional point of view, because the volume, I mean, start to be quite interesting. People is going to use mobile, people is going to use table most of the time, even more than using standard laptop or standard PC. Uh, so the question is, um, I cannot figure out for the picture, but maybe it was my mistake. Uh, is there any type of uh, um, research or any type of uh, interest in analyzing the hardware-assisted virtualization support for these uh, devices? 
Sorry, is there a repeat the question? Are there assisted virtualization? I'm sorry, I'm not. Yeah. Which type of uh, um, assistance for the virtualization in this device is possible in an hardware point of view? <laughs> I mean, I can just make as an example. I'm talking about the um, the uh, hardware assistant for the content switch, hardware assistant for the uh, the pipeline of the traffic, hardware assistant about memory, um, hardware assistant for even the cache handling. So every type of hardware assistant, because this will uh, obviously uh, dramatically decrease the cost of the virtualization, and so it's actually it's actually dramatically decreased the power consumed by a virtualized system and also increasing the performance because the uh, resources are not consumed by the virtualization layer. Yeah, so I'll give you the short answer, which is yes, and uh, we can <laughs> talk at lunch or during the break. And <laughs> yeah. thank, you. thank you very much.